Welcome to the Shaltazar Podcast. My name is Jeffrey Eisen. I am a spiritual life coach, channeler of Shaltazar, and an energy intuitive. This podcast is about using spiritual wisdom, insights, principles, and practices to integrate and embody into your life in a practical way. My guests share their story of their spiritual journey, as well as how their spiritual beliefs, insights, and practices have helped them live a better life. Their life stories help others understand and accept life's challenging opportunities for learning, expansion, and growth. The Shaltazar podcast is all about integrating spiritual wisdom into your life in a practical way. And my guest today on the Jeffrey Eisen podcast is Lynn K. Russell from Lethbridge, Alberta, a fellow Canadian. Welcome to the uh, podcast, Lynn. Oh, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you for asking me. Yeah, it is my pleasure. I met Lynn, I forget where, over social media, probably LinkedIn. We've had a few chats. She's a tremendous inspiration to me because Lynn is 82 years old and she has more energy than I do and is doing amazing work. And so the inspiration for me at 68 is that there is hope for me in the next (laughs) number of years to continue to do the great work that I know Lynn is doing. Lynn, why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about your personal history and tell us how you got into near-death experiences because that is what I really want to talk about on today's show. Okay. Well, I got into spirituality because I was felt frightened of dying. I found out about eight or nine I was that I found out I was going to die. And so I wanted to know, well, what happened? And my mom was an atheist. And so she said, well, you just disappear. <laughs> you don't do anything when you die. So I that it even made me more frightened. So in my mid-teens, I started studying all kinds of religions and their background and how did they get to where they were. And so I became very, very interested in religions. Well, then I couldn't find any answers that way. So then I went to spirituality, which was just blossoming in around the 60s, 70s. It was just coming out and that was a perfect timing for me. So I got quite involved with that and uh, quite interested in what was out then. But I still didn't get any answers. I did have some personal spiritual experiences that were mind-boggling. They alluded to oneness and things like that, but I didn't quite put pieces together until later. Then after I I was a family counselor for 30 years. And so after I retired, I went, I was going to be a writer. And so I went on to NDERF, which stands for Near Death Experience Research Foundation. And I was looking up some information to relate to my book that I was going to write. But I caught into this near death stuff. I thought it was fabulous. It was exactly what I was looking for. And I already had read some, so that was cool. So anyway, while I was on there, Dr. Long, Dr. Jeffrey Long, asked for someone to volunteer to be a researcher. And so I had just retired. I had all kinds of time. So I put my hand up. (laughs) So I did the research. But in the beginning of the research, it was interesting what happens when you die. What is this story all about? But as I got into it more and more and more, I started to see the deeper messages that were coming back. When you put like a few hundred it was like, okay, that's what happens. But after a while, there were deeper kind of information. And that was really what I was after. So that's what I had pursued is that deeper understanding of not only what happens at that, but also what are those deeper spiritual lessons. Excellent. Excellent. And I want to talk to you about that. But before I do, you piqued my interest when you said that you studied the religions of the world and they didn't give you the answers and you went on to spiritual spirituality. Tell me more and tell the listeners a bit more about what you learned from studying the religions and of the world and how they didn't give you the answers and how they are different than your perception of spirituality. Well, you have to understand that I was a teenager. And so as soon as I got my nose bumped up against the um, dogmas and what we were to do and not to do, I said, no, 
adult way. <laughs> but what I, what I was fascinated with is how did these religions become what they are today? And so that was one of the avenues that I wandered down. But the other thing is that even though I didn't realize it at the time, I thought I was just being curious. I really was searching for something for me that was going to fit for me. If somebody had told me that, I would have rejected it and said, no, no, no. You know, but actually that is what I was doing. And when I would read some of the um, information, the, the base was always beautiful. There was always love and acceptance and giving, you know, it was really the base of most religions is to care for one another. Right. And, so, uh, that, sorry to interrupt, uh, but so the question I, I'm really interested in asking is what happened? What happened to those religions that had yeah. a foundation in love and acceptance? How did the dogma become more judgmental and more, yeah. uh, I gotta watch my words <laughs> on what I say, yeah. and I can certainly uh -huh. relate to you because when I went on my journey of self-discovery, I tried to find the relevance in the religion I was born into, and I too had some difficulty with it. So what is your perspective on how that foundation or that base got uh, maybe waylaid a little bit or twisted? Well, I think a few things happened. One, I think that just human beings. And so a story would be told and then it would get tweaked and it would get changed slightly here and there and so on. That was one thing. Another thing was that power and control became a part of it. And fear is one of the best controllers in the world for anything. And so there was a lot of fear base built in and that really is very, very strong. And that is in almost all of the religions except Buddhism. Buddhism doesn't have a base of fear, but mm -hmm. all of the other religions do. But then Buddhism can be a religion or it can be a philosophy that you follow while you're somebody, you're some other religion at the same time. My understanding of Buddhism, a little bit that I've, I've studied, it's the one religion that doesn't focus as much on the higher power but more so on, as you say, the philosophy or the way of life. So that's why there's there's less fear. There tends to be in the other religions, the fear coming from this higher power. And I was always very confused how we could take this base of love and oneness and unity, you know, twist it into to more control and fear. And you brought up a tremendous subject, and that is fear, because we're in the midst of a COVID situation, which is extremely rooted in fear. And mm -hmm. I know we're going to move into talking about near-death experience, and I'm sure mm -hmm. that you're going to share mm -hmm. with us how love is really the cornerstone of that experience. I would suggest that to our current COVID challenge, we need to bring some more love and understanding and empathy, because if we keep feeding the fear, yeah. I think we may start um, killing each other, and yes. uh, I don't think that's a good thing. Yes, I agree, Jeffrey. Actually, we need to understand and our reality that and it's been talked to us about for centuries. We've been told over and over and over again about how we are connected to the source and that there is really only one entity, one soul, one spirit, and that we are all one, we are all connected with each other in that way. And if we really understood not only our connection with each other, but our own reality, if we could understand our own reality and what we really are, which is absolutely magnificent, and we would be so much better. And that is what I want people to hold on to, is the beauty of their being and that they can accomplish anything they want as long as they believe in themselves and their and know that this is their base. Their base is a part, the source, being a part of the source. Right. If we we could listen to our essence more than the opinions of others and the fear of others, right. I think we would be much better off. Excellent. Yes. Let's move into, I'm really excited and chomping at the bit in terms of what you've learned from near-death experience. So tell me a bit about, as you started to do the research, what it was like. You had a bit of a foundation of spirituality. You had a bit of an interest, but I'm assuming this research was actually getting into the nitty gritty of people who had experienced experienced near-death occurrences. Is that correct? Yes, yes. And some of them were so beautiful, just mind-boggling. I'm sorry, I don't remember all their names, but some stick out. But anyway, yes. Well, one of the things that I learned was the actual death, leaving your body as smooth as silk. As a matter of fact, you don't even notice. It's easier than what, taking a step over a threshold. It just happens. You're, you find yourself, oh, 
I'm, I'm out of my body. It's a very smooth process. And some people are confused and wondering what, what's happening. And uh, almost, now, not every, one of the things that I want to stress is that Every death experience is different. There's no two death experiences that are alike. So when I'm talking, I'm talking in generality. And so most sorry, people... Sorry to, interrupt, like, sorry to interrupt, Linda. Help no. me understand. Clarify a bit more when you say that each death experience is different. Different in what way? Well, it's different. For example, we hear about this, the tunnel, but no two tunnels are the same. Some are bricks and some are smoke and some are white and some are colored and some are not, you know, black and so there's no tunnel that is alike for another one is that people go to gardens or to natural you know a nature setting in the mountains or whatever and uh, every one of those are different they're never the same the same with the buildings and any place any physical place that these people go to or at least that they see as being physical i should say quite different from everybody else's you know there's no two that are exactly alike there right. are are elements that are very, very, that are the uh, same, uh, identical. And those are the things that, that excited me because of the ramifications of them. For example, so, there's sorry no to interrupt time again. Yeah, Sorry to interrupt, okay. but so what I hear you saying is that your individual life, just like everyone's life is a little bit different, as mm-hmm. you're crossing back over into the void, back into the oneness, that yes. transition is different, most likely based on your own personal history, your own experiences. And my assumption is that when we get fully back into the oneness at the end of the tunnel, that's where it's all the same. Is that correct? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that, I'm learning. I appreciate this. No, that's great. That's great. Okay. What happens, we talk about the oneness and we say that we are a part of the source. But the thing that we miss is that we are creator and we are creating this life that we are living right now. And we just continue to create and we're on the other side. <laughs> just, we're individually creating the death experience that we had and we're individually creating the life that we are living now. So does that mean that if I play my cards right, I can create a death experience that has a more pleasant tunnel than someone else's? <laughs> You will have the tunnel that you create. There's one lady, and her name is Nancy Dennison, and she had a death experience where she was in the tunnel and heading up to wherever she was going, or sideways or whatever. She was going wherever she was going, and she realized that she was creating this. And so she, out of the blue, said she thought of somewhere else that you, you know, another place. I don't remember what it was, but anyway, another place. And instantly she was there. Hmm. And it was just as real as this. So yeah, so, that's and, a and, very and that's, important one. Yeah, it is because, of course, while we're in physical form, although creation, I believe, is slowed down, we still have that ability to create our reality. Always, even right now, we do. This minute, we could change the world mm-hmm. in a second. And we hear it all the time. How many times have you heard statements saying, be the change you want to see in the world? Mm-hmm. And that's all we need to do. Yeah, that's one of my favorites. That's one of my favorites. <laughs> yeah. tell, me, tell me a bit about, because I, I'm always fascinated you know, with the death experience. I recently lost my mother a few months ago. And with people that don't experience the near death, they're gone. And my communication with my mother right. is more in a spiritual nature. I, I I don't get a chance to talk to her about transitioning over because she didn't come back. The fascinating thing about the near-death experience is that they come back. Did you get a chance to talk to some of these people? Yes, I did. And um, some, what happens, some of the people, okay, let me explain that. Some people are dead for up to 12, 14 or more hours. And those people have very in-depth kinds of experiences. So they can, you know, they actually do have what I would think happens when you are dead. And then they come back hours and hours later. So, um, What happens is they are in this place that they most of people, most people see as physical, a physical garden or other loved ones or whatever. And they see themselves as being physical. But after a little while, their guide, usually their guides, but sometimes they themselves will realize that this isn't the real themselves. This isn't real. This is what they created, this, this physical world. And so then they realize that they are a spark of light that belongs to the huge light that 
that they see. And I didn't mention that one. But anyway, there's this big light. And so then when they realize that they are energy, a spark of energy or light or, you know, aliveness or whatever, I don't know what else to call it, then they enter into the light. Now, some people who enter into the light come out and have, you know, come back here. Other people stay and they become the light and they actually become a, the creator. And that's, that's their final home. So tell me about the ones that come back. That's where I'm fascinated because they then get to relate that out-of-body experience back in yeah. human life. Yeah. Tell me about some cases that you researched and how their physical life changed when they came back. Well, one of the things that happens to most, they have, when they're on the other side, and I'm sure everybody's heard about the life review. So they have a life review and that has a huge impact on them because they realize that how they are in this life has a, a strong effect on what's going to happen on the other side. And it's a kind of person you are, not how many things you have or how rich or whatever. So when they are on the other side and they are experiencing their death or their life review, when they come back, they are changed. They care about others. They um, want very much good for the world. And so you find them everywhere. I mean, they are all over the internet of trying to have sites and give advice to the world world to better it and to make it a better place. So that's one of the things. They're usually more flexible. They don't care about the rigidity. They're, they're, and if they had a rigidity before, like, for example, racism or something like that, it's gone. It's completely 100% gone. They don't, you know. Why, why, and, do you think that, why do you think that is, Lynn? Well, because they realize that person over there is, is a part of me. And that person over there is exactly the same as I am, except they just look a little different. And that's just the spice that we put into a wonderful feast. <laughs> mm -hmm. Tell me a bit more. I, I'm fascinated. I, I have heard, of course, of, of the life review. And, you know, Shaltazar has, has led me to believe, or I've interpreted a bit about that life review. And, of course, we can't understand it intellectually. But from the research you've done, give us give the listeners a bit of a sense of what that life review is all about. What happens with the life review is we see our whole life from birth to the time that we died. And um, the emphasis of the life review is how were we with other people? It really, ha or with nature or with other life, you know, with the world. But it has nothing to do with your station or your job or your, unless your job, you know, unless, I guess, how you are with other people at work. That would be all, all that would matter. It doesn't matter what your work is or you know, even even a street person would have the same. And it's how you treat other people around you. And then you also feel you become that other person and you actually feel what they feel. So, they, so I'm getting the sense that the life review is taking on the perspective of your interaction with other humans, yes. which, yes. which is very yes, interesting absolutely. because, yeah, because in, in human life, we tend to think of it in terms of materialism, jobs, careers, yes. cars, yes. Yes. but not that interaction. And so yes. what I'm interpreting you saying is, is someone who has had a, a death experience comes back and has changed their perspective because they realize that life is all about the connections with yeah. other human beings, with other life, right? That's perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, great. Great. Excellent. And so what are some interesting, some of the more interesting stories that you can recall and, you know, just whatever comes to you in terms of, mm -hmm. of some interesting people that have experienced this uh, death experience? As I said, one of them, and I can't, there was one that blew my mind and it blows everybody's mind. And this one is recorded. And it was um, a man who was in the Navy and he had, he'd been died, doing diving, deep sea diving. And he had accidentally got a poison coral in his foot. And so he had to get to back on the ship right away. And uh, so anyway, they got him onto the ship. But by the time they got them there, it was too late and he died. The doctor had put, why I don't know, but anyway, the doctor had put an EEG on his head while he was still alive. And so then he died and the doctor just left it there and it was running. 
And he returned 29 hours later. Oh my and goodness. there was the BEG still running. Wow. All 29 that, yeah. hours. Wow. Yeah. So that is blowing everybody's mind. <laughs> That's right. a pretty yeah. amazing one. Yeah. And, and so let me ask you, Lynn, I'm sure <clears throat> that science tries to come up with more of a scientific explanation. You and I that are very spiritual, it's a lot easier for us to explain this away. What does science say? about near-death experiences? Well, of course, they don't believe it because it's not something you can test. But actually, you can. I've written an article, I think it's in Science and Non-Duality, and it talks about how we could test um, NDEs, but that's beside the point. What they don't they, they look at, you know, it's the brain breaking down or the chemicals or, you know, some drugs that they've taken or whatever. But the people who have been dead for 14, they wake up in the state of rigor mortis, in the morgue. They've been pronounced dead. Everything has stopped. And 13 to 14 hours later, they wake up and they're frozen. Stiff. They can't move. And then they have to somehow manage to get the attention of the attendant that's there to let them know that they are actually alive. But my point is that any NDE that lasts that long cannot be the breaking down of the brain or the drugs or whatever else. That's mm-hmm. just too long. And the 29 hour one for sure. Right. Now, I've also heard of people that have had had shorter death experiences, car accident, and mm. it's, you know, a matter of hour or two or less. No. Are those, have you researched any of those? And are those experiences from the person's perspective any different because it's shorter? No, no, not really. No, maybe the only difference would be, as I said before, that the ones who had been on the other side for a long time, some of them enter into the light and become the light and become the creators. So that's the only difference. People who have had quick, one man thought he was gone for 150 years. He actually believed that he was on the other side for 150 years. When he came back, he'd only been gone 10, 15. Wow, <laughs> wow. Is yeah. That- so, so it's been time it yeah. doesn't exist on the other side. Just yeah, not, yeah. Not that, that's fascinating. I've, I've channeled some stuff. Uh, one of the messages I channeled from Shaltazar was moving beyond the fourth dimension, which is time, and, and yeah. how on the other side there is no time, which is fascinating. Yeah. Lynn, you've written a book called The Wonder of You, What the Near-Death Experiences Tell You About Yourself. Tell the listeners a bit about that book. I'm sure it's as fascinating as you, and I highly recommend that the listeners find it. You can tell people where they can get it, but tell Tell us a bit about how a near-death experience tells us about ourselves. Well, my book, it's the second edition that's out now. The first edition was mostly to do with what happens when you die. And the second edition is primarily to do with the spiritual lessons that I'm talking about. And that's the one that's out now. And it is also a more concentration on consciousness because that is our reality, is consciousness. And so that's what this second edition is. And it's just filled with all kinds of ways to show you how magnificent you are. Mm -hmm. People just don't realize how magnificent they are, and they need to, because that will bring peace to the world. Oh, I'm with you on that one. Where can people uh, find your book? Well, it's online. It's on Amazon, but it's on a number of other online. But if you go to my website, and my website is uh, HD, TTP, whatever, and then lynnkrussell.com. Be sure to put the K in because um, there's just a bazillion Lynn Russells out there, and that's my distinction. So lynnkrussell.com, and then I have links where you can buy books and get all kinds of information, and there's all kinds of reviews on my site as well. I've checked out your site. I highly recommend it, and the link to your site will be in the description of our podcast, so I highly recommend that people check it out. Lynn, we're we're drawing close to the the end of our time. But before we do, from all of the research that you've done on death experiences, from all of your amazing research on spirituality, what message do you have for listeners in this difficult, challenging time that we're going through? Yeah. 
my message would be you have got way more you can do this you can do this there is way more within you than you are giving yourself credit for and it's okay bad things happen and we get over them and you will get over this this is just one more experience in this movie of life Mm -hmm. i like that i like that and i'm going to suggest from what you suggested from the the life reviews that without experiencing death or without having a near-death experience, if humans could learn to relate to other humans in a mm-hmm. kinder, gentler, more empathetic way. we I really believe we need this. This COVID thing is bringing up infighting. It's bringing up blaming, complaining. There is no one way that anyone could handle this. Most people that are alive today have not experienced it. Most of the scientists and medical professionals have not experienced a pandemic of this right. magnitude. Right. So I think it's all about bringing that love from above down to your interactions with other people. We need to melt away fear with a little bit of love. Would you agree? Yeah, totally. 100%. There is one other point I want to point out, if please. We, I talked a little tiny bit about fear and I actually started writing, I think it's an article, but it might wind up to be a book. (laughs) And it's talking about fear and how fear is today being used used as a tool to frighten us so that we will do other people's bidding. And that's what's happening right now. So yes, COVID is something to worry about and to stay at home and to look after yourself and to do all the, you know, to follow all the rules. But we are added, we've had so much added fear to that is irrelevant. It really doesn't matter. And we need to understand the difference. For example, commercials. Commercials are based on fear. If you don't have our product, then something horrible will happen. You know, I mean, that's just one small example. But politics is using it, particularly the far right wing. You know, they use fear to get us to do their bidding. And we need to understand it. And when we understand it, then we will have control. Ah, beautifully put. Excellent. Excellent advice. Beware of the fear because it is, I think, the more harmful virus than COVID. Fear. Yeah is really damaging us. I am very much in favor of respecting this virus, respecting the fact that it is a harmful virus that can create physical maladies and harm and disease. The fear, the emotional virus of fear is worse. We talked at the beginning about how fear was instrumental in changing spirituality into the dogma of religions. So let's be careful, listeners. Let's not get infested by the fear that is buzzing around us. Let's move to love. Let's learn the lesson that those who have had near-death experiences have through their life review and begin to be committed to a more loving human connection with other people. Would you agree, Lynn? Absolutely. I love it. (laughs) And that's my message. (laughs) Excellent. Thank you so much for being an amazing guest. We talked about where people can find you on lynnkrussell.com. I highly encourage people to check that out. Please do so. And Lynn, I'm sure would love to uh, connect with you. You can get her contact information on her website. There is a whole bunch of interviews she has done. As I mentioned earlier, you are tremendous inspiration to me. You're 82 and still still going strong and spreading that message. I'm only 68, so I look forward to following in your footsteps. Thank you, Lynn, so much for being an amazing guest on the show. Oh, you're welcome. And thank you so much for asking me. I'm glad to have an opportunity to share with the people. Thank you. And once again, I'm Jeffrey Eisen, a spiritual life coach, the channeler of Shaltazar and an energy intuitive. If you want to find out more about me, check out my website at jeffreyeisen.com. Thank you, Lynn, once again. Love and light to you all.